welcome to church. We gather to worship an amazing God who created the heavens, the earth, all that lives, crucified, buried, risen, holy. Jesus is good. Jesus is forever. You are loved. You are accepted. You belong. Welcome to Revision Church. Good morning, Revision family. Good morning, everyone here. Good morning, everyone online. So nice to see you. Let's all stand as we have opening prayer and enter into our worship today. Let us all stand. Lord, we thank you for your blessings, and we just ask for your continual presence in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. Feel free to remain standing as we bless the Lord together. Bless the Lord with me. It just simply says, bless the Lord with me. Come on and bless the Lord with me. Come on and bless the Lord with me. Come on and bless the Lord with me. Hey, bless the Lord with me. Come on and join. Bless the Lord.
Good morning, good morning, Revision Church. All right, y'all need to say that like you got some energy today. Let's try it again. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. We're glad that you are here, glad that we are in this place. We welcome you in this building. We welcome all those who are joining us online all across this country and all around the world. Amen. God bless you today. Amen. I hope you all know this morning that you are loved. Yeah. Loved by God and loved by your Revision Church family. Yeah, we are grateful for all of you, and we're glad that you are here today. We want to do some shout-outs. This is something, if you're new, that we do, especially if you're online, but even if you're in the building, you can do that. Whip out your mobile device, your phone, and just, uh, just drop in the chat, in the live chat there on YouTube, there on Facebook. Just say good morning and let us know where you are watching from. We'd love to say good morning to you. All right? All right. Okay. What's that? Oh, new, okay. All right, all right. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to make sure that we can see what you're doing. Yeah, I think I'm using it. I got it. I got okay. it. All right. So we want to be able to see you. Thank you to our media team. So good morning, good morning, everybody. On live chat, just drop it in the chat. They're going to put it on the screen so we can say good morning to you by name. We'd love to greet you today greet you today just drop that in the chat wherever you are wherever you are all right let's see there we go there we go Good we've morning. got Ken Yuke from Nairobi oh Kenya. welcome Nairobi. welcome welcome from all the way the from motherland motherland that's right yes. Who else we got All here? All right, the Drummonds in New York. Yes. Hello, family. Did you notice they moved from back from Tallahassee to New York? To, oh, no, I didn't know they moved. I thought they were traveling. Oh, no, no. They were in Florida. They were well, he was let at me FAMU. Tell you. Yeah. Okay, that's my alma mater now, that's right, FAMU. That's right. But if you can do that, I think you can make your way to Atlanta. How about that? That's right, Drummonds. All right, Drummonds, come on. All right, all right. Doug Golding, all right, from Patterson, New Jersey. Jersey. Thank you for being with us today, worshiping with us. All right. Okay, Carmen from London. All Our right. London family, our UK bunch. That's welcome, right. welcome. That's right. Karen Dove Odomusu. All right, from Marietta. Marietta, not far. Right, okay, Washington, welcome. Not far. All right, thank so you. So glad you joined us. All right, us. that's right. Hey, listen, the Roll family, thank you for joining, for getting all our, you in the building, the Roll that's family. That's right. In fact, uh, they dedicated their beautiful baby girl today, and so we Amen. congratulate them again. All right, we all got. All right, Tina from the UK, still part of our extended family. Guys, we are worldwide here that's at Revision right. Church Atlanta. That's right, that's right. Yes. All right, Seven Palmer, Dennis, uh, coming from the Dennis family, Valdosta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Valdosta. Yeah. We've been to Valdosta before. Well, that was always, when I lived in Florida, if we were heading to Alabama, that was our halfway mark. Okay. We kind of stop right. in Valdosta, then Valdosta on Alabama. That's right, that's right. All right, yeah. good stuff. Elaine Thompson, hey, welcome back. From All right. Edmonton, Alberta, Western Canada. Canada is being represented today. Good to see you. What's up, Shireen? In the house. All right, here in person. Good to see you. Glad you got online. Got, got in the chat, even though I see you right back there. <laughs> All right, Patrick Legger from the DR, Dominican Wonderful. Republic. Wonderful. Welcome, welcome. All right. All we right. like the DR too. Oh, yeah, we love We've the DR. We've been there, very nice. Yeah, great vacation spot. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. Good morning, everybody. All there in the chat, just make sure you're saying good morning, greeting everybody. We have, uh, we like to create uh, some more connection and interaction even in the chat. We know for those of us who are here in the building, we have our own experience, but we want to make sure that we're connecting with those who are online. So we do have a connection question. We want you to make sure that you keep your mobile device handy so that you can answer this question today. We know it's Mental Health Awareness Month, yes. and we want to be remain aware of that and keep talking about that. So we're going to put this question up. And the question is, what do you do, church? What do you do to find peace? What do you, what, do? What do, you do to find peace? We'll have it on the screen in just a minute, but the question is, what do you do to find peace? Just grab your mobile device if you haven't done so already. Jump into the chat there on Facebook and YouTube, and we want to see your answers. You don't have to write an essay. You don't have to write a paragraph. Just a couple things. Let us know in a sentence or in a phrase. What do you do, what do, you do to find peace? So, what do you do? I just, I have to say, La, mm -hmm. I have to pause. Yeah. I have to be still for a moment, and that 
centers me so that I can begin to find my peace. Because usually when my peace leaves me, it's because I'm too busy and things are chaotic. That's right. So I just take a pause. How about you? And in that pause, you draw a hot bath sometimes. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, so you're trying to go there. (laughs) Yeah. So I do that. The Epsom salts are a blessing, you all. The ones with a little lavender essence. Anybody know about Epsom salts? Come on. Come on, somebody. Come on. Oh, if you don't know, you will know eventually. By those absence, I light a candle. Uh huh. Um, uh-huh. I enjoy some jazz. Yeah. It blesses me real good. Yeah. And so I put a little of that on and dim the lights and I just deep breathe. Okay. How about you? So you play jazz in the tub, not gospel, huh? <laughs> the gospel lives within me. Jazz just accentuates the goodness. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Right. You know I, you like. I you know you listen to gospel. that jazz right. too. <laughs> <laughs> Sure do. Uh-huh. Miles Davis, Coltrane. Come on, All somebody right. talk to me. All right. All right. What do uh, you do? Oh, you asked me what yeah, do I do? Yeah, I'm asking you what we do you do. Get to the people. No, no, you don't, you don't get to do that. <laughs> it's your turn. I get away. Now you will leave. From all y'all. <laughs> You'll get in that car, but you do it nicely. I do it nicely, yeah. But I you don't have like, an yeah. attitude. No, no, yeah. not, not anymore. <laughs> Look at God. <laughs> Oh, God is good. <laughs> Let me move on before you tell all our business. All right. How do you find peace? We talked about how we find peace. How do you find peace? I saw Amber was up there. Let's throw some of these Amber, some of these up. Hey, okay. what's up, Ruddick family? Our family Yay, from Toronto. hello, sister. Find God in the trees, in nature. Okay, in nature, oh, yes. And y'all, y'all way out there in them trees. And you find your peace. There's good, lots good. of trees out there where you are. All right. All right, Kenny in the back. What's up, Kenny? All right. Something creative. Right. Draw. Dance. Dance. Cook. Yeah, Music. yeah, yeah. I saw you dancing the other day. All right. <laughs> All right. What? <laughs> All right, what, what else we got? Okay, Simone, okay. Hey, what's up, Simone? You go for a walk while you're listening to music. Oh, walking good way is to good. Find peace. Good yeah, way. walking Come on, is come good. on, let's keep them going. Stacy B. Wallace says, I pray, work I out. work out, and breathe. Oh, yes, Lord. Oh, yeah, that's a yes, good one. That's, that's good a good one. For you. All right, it's okay. okay, yeah, singing on our praise team today. Okay. Changing my perspective to ensure peace is the option. Mm, that's now good. that's powerful. That's good. That's a, a word. A shift in, a pers- in your perspective, perspective can take you a long way. Absolutely. Ooh, that's God, good. Yes. Thank you. Karen Dove Odomusu says drive for hours. Yes, Lord. Yeah, some people relax by driving, mm-hmm. kind of driving, changing your scenery. Yeah, that's All right, good. what does Joyce say? Um, love gardening and plants. I enjoy flowers now. Excellent. All right, that's good Excellent, stuff. Excellent, Joyce. Yeah, yeah. David, we already know. We we know what you do to find peace. <laughs> you just running, running all the time. That's good, though. That's good stuff, though. That's Get your real exercise good. and you're getting your peace. Yes. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Uh, listen, listen. However, you find peace, we want to make sure that on a weekly basis, on that you make it part of your routine, whatever it is that gets you in that place of peace, to do it. In fact, today, I want you, you know, someone who said something that was really good. And if we can, I just want you to take a deep breath in. Come on, everybody take a deep breath in. And then exhale. You are in the presence of God, wherever you are, in this building, in your home, driving in your car right now. If you're listening to us, watching us, you are in the presence of God. Deep breathe and know that God's got you. God's got you today. If you're glad that God's got you today, put your hands together and praise God. Today, we're going to find our peace. Today, we're going to find our peace in worship. And so today, as we come to the time of prayer, we want to uh, invite you, those of you who are with us online, to just drop your prayer requests, those that you don't mind sharing, those you want somebody to partner with you in praying today. Would you just drop that in the chat so that we might pray for you? Our prayer team is always standing by, taking notes to pray for you by name and by your situation. Mm -hmm. And so drop those in the chat. They're on Facebook and YouTube, and we're getting ready to pray as our First Lady will lead us in prayer even now. For those of you who are in the building, we invite you, if you would please just rise to your feet, stand as we get ready to go to the throne of grace together. And for those of you who are at home, we invite you to get into your prayer posture as we seek the face of our Creator today. Oh God, we just bless you this morning. We bless you because you have been a father to the fatherless and a mother to the motherless. 
Oh, you are God, our Father and our Mother, and we bless you this morning. We are so glad that our God is the supreme God. Our God is an able God. Our God is strong. Our God is mighty. Our God is all-knowing and all-able, and he loves us, and he cares. And his son is acquainted with our griefs and our sorrows. And that means that there's nothing too small for us to take to God. Nothing too little for us to take to God. Nothing too insignificant that we can't take it to our Father because our Father cares. And we rest in that today. We find peace in that today. We lavish ourselves in your love today. Oh, you're such a worthy God. And we bring to you our, our praise. We bring to you our adoration. We exalt you as the true and the living God. We declare before the world that there is none like you. We're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We realize that it's power unto salvation. And we want to thank you for the blood. The blood that takes away our shame. The blood that takes away the pain. The blood that lets us know that we are new creatures in you. And because you live, we can face tomorrow. We don't have to live beneath our means. We don't have to take our lives. We don't have to give up on love and hope. We know that you are able to do the impossible. So we rest in that today, God. Oh God, this morning, we brought our children to you. We've dedicated them to you and we dedicate ourselves to you. Today there'll be a baptism. And as our brothers and sisters give their hearts to you, we, re, we give ourselves back to you as well. Lord, we thank you that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you for your resurrection power. We thank you that you look beyond our faults and meet our needs. We thank you for the capacity to love even our neighbors, those who mistreat us, those who talk about us. We know that it's only because of you, God, that we can love. We know that it's only because of you, God, that we can keep on keeping on. It's only because of your goodness and your grace. So we thank you for loving us first and loving us best. If there's anyone here, God, who in their spirit, they just don't feel right. May they know that you are waiting for them with open arms and that you will not cast them aside. May they know that you are for them and not against them. May you bind the enemy in all of his works and his tactics to discourage us and to give us doubt. And may we trust in the Lord and in the power of his might. May we, may we know that there is greater in us than he that is in the world. Lord, may we love you with every ounce of our being so that we can know that we serve a true and living God. So God, we await what you're going to do today through your word, through song, through ministry, through the preach word. And we declare that we will never be the same because he lives. We will never be the same because he lives. So we thank you for living in our hearts, our minds and our spirit in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And come amen. on, come on, say amen. Come on, put your hands together if you agree today. Yes, yes, yes. Turn to your neighbor, turn to your neighbor and just say, neighbor, whatever it is, it's going to be all right. Yeah, we got to encourage each other. Amen, amen, amen. We just want to remember in prayer today. We're getting ready to dismiss our children, but we want to remember in prayer uh, Gabriel and Sydney Carter as they have lost Gabriel's lost his maternal grandfather and we want to uh, continue to lift them up in prayers and know as they walk through this valley yes. of the shadow of death that they are not alone that God is with them so let's continue to keep them in prayer for all those who have lost a loved one recently I want to let you know that we stand with you, that we are praying yes. for you. Let's remember to keep each other in prayer today. Today, we want to let you know we do have Revision Kids. 
Every time we're in person, we have a wonderful opportunity for your kids to learn about Jesus in a fun and interactive way. And so, parents, you can now, um, you can now escort your lovely children, your precious ones, as you exit that way. We've got our staff ready to receive them with gladness. We've got great things in store for them today, and we're looking forward to what God is going to do. We are... Uh, Media team, is it okay if we pull an audible here? Can we do the video now? Can we, are we ready? We're good? All right, so what we want you to see is, you know that we've done some rewrite stories, how God rewrites our stories. Today we got a special one for you. We really want you to really sit back and, lean, no, not sit back, really lean in yes. to what you're about to see as we see this powerful story from our media director, Duran Carrington. Amen. We want you to watch this and be encouraged. Amen. My name is Duran Carrington, and this is my faith story. So about 20 years ago, I was um, diagnosed with uh, a liver disease called PSC, um, primary scoliosis and cholangitis. Essentially, what it meant was I had a genetic defect that would cause my liver to cirrhose um, over a matter of time. And um, had been managing it with medication, uh, liver wasn't 100% functional, but it was 85, 80% functional. Um, medication kind of kept me st stable. Um, but in the beginning of 2022, I contracted the vid and um, really couldn't bounce back from that. Um, my levels started to spike a lot. My liver enzyme levels started to spike a lot. And um, I ended up going to another physician just to get a checkup um, to just make sure that the protocol that I was on with the first doctors was effective and if they could see anything. And uh, so they transferred me over to Piedmont Liver Center and um, give a shout out to Dr. Andrew uh, Limmer. It's my dude, saved my life, man, saved my life, good, good guy. And um, for the first few months, they thought, well, we'll just see how you recover from COVID and see if you can start putting back on weight, my energy. Well, um, come back, but uh, it didn't. It didn't and started to get a lot of side effects. And one of the major things with having a deteriorating liver, um, of course, the liver processes the toxins in the body and it produces a substance called bile that helps you di digest your foods and things of that nature. And my bile level started to get very, very high and um, the body wasn't uh, excreting it at a, a normal level where it dumps into your intestines to help you process food. It was building, it was backing up in my system. So it was creating a lot of poison and toxins, which side effects are yellowing eyes, like a baby, um, itchy skin, which uh, really decreases your quality of life. Uh, so about May, um, I was in a, in a bad place, man. Weight was down, energy levels were down, um, itchy, you know, you find yourself the palms of your hand and their feet, um, just the quality of life was horrible. So they went in, they, they tried to put in some stents, which are essentially straws to kind of open up those bio ducts to help it to drain better. And um, unfortunately, it didn't help. But while they were there doing the stents inside of my liver, they took some samples and uh, one day they called me and said, hey, we want you to come and want to talk with you. And I said, okay, 
And when I came in, they said, you know, we're checking on how the stints have helped you, but also we want to see, we want to let you know that we did some additional samples and we did what's called a fish, a fish test. And it's an acronym that stands for some type of fluorescent something. And essentially what they told me was that they saw cancer cells in my liver and essentially I had the early onset of liver cancer. Um, and that's another big word, which is cholangeal carcinoma. And um, when they told me that, that really shook me, you know, um, because I had been fighting with this thing for 20 years and I remember going out in my car and um, talking with a good friend of mine. And uh, to be real, I mean, I cried, bro. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I was just telling God, like, you know, can I catch a break, bro? Like, can I catch a... I'm trying to live right. I'm trying to, I just can't catch a break, man. And now, cancer? Like, yo, this is crazy. I didn't really, I don't drink. Like, so how? You know, with that, worked through it. You know, good friend, my family, they supported me. And um, they said, well, look, the upside of this is, Mr. Carrington, you're young. Um, you're relatively healthy. The only tough part is you just have just bad liver. You know, and it's really just the ducts of your liver that are bad and the outside of your liver is super healthy, just the inside of your ducts. Um, but what we can do is um, push you towards a transplant earlier, which as I said, 20 years ago when I was first diagnosed, they told me that like, you know, at some point in your life, you might need liver transplant. It just happened a lot quicker than I anticipated. Long story short, by September, I was doing 30 days of chemo, 30 days of radiation, um, twice a day driving back and forth to the hospital, you know, to treat the cancer inside of my liver to prepare me for getting on the list for a liver transplant because um, even though my quality of life was bad, it wasn't bad enough to jump in front of someone whose liver was not functioning. So I would have just had to suffer, you know, until my liver just totally wasn't functioning. But with this process, what they call the Mayo process, it allowed me to be jumped in line. Um, went through that, had to wait six weeks to have the final evaluation. I went in for that final evaluation. My mom came to town, she was in the hospital with me. And the in-between is I'm skipping over a lot of stuff, but um, from September to November, I spent a significant amount of time in the hospital um, because of blood clots. Um, I had a bag that was draining bile. I came to church once in the back, and I had just got out that Friday Set in the back, I was like, ah, I feel good, come to church. And I felt something in my shirt when I reached down, full of blood. I had to go back to the hospital that Saturday. And um, that was actually the Saturday before they were doing the final evaluation. So the doctor came in and said, hey, Mr. Karen, you've just been having a rough go of it. Just stay in the hospital for this week. We were doing the final evaluation so we can get you on the transplant. And so I stayed there for like two weeks straight, man, just working. And then my mom came to town. On the 1st of December, they did uh, the evaluation, fingers crossed, prayer, came back and said, Mr. Carrington, everything is good. Looks like we burnt the cancer away, and now we can put you on the list to be a recipient of a liver. Within three days, I had a liver transplant. And it was surreal because one, I was anticipating that I would have to stay on the list for an extended amount of time but it just happened so quickly. It happened so quickly. I honestly struggled with like, I'm not sure what the proper term is, but survivors, like what makes me so worthy? Which in three days to receive an organ and the doctor reassured me, he said, you know, this liver was for you. It was specifically for you. Um, and it was bittersweet too, because someone died so that I could live. Uh, through this experience, um, first and foremost, like my relationship with God was, it's like, it's rock solid now, it's rock solid. I ain't nobody theologian, nothing like that, but what I know, I know now, you know, um, about God and my walk with God, I know that person for myself. Because there were so many times um, that in the evening, I mean, it was, it was a painful process, physically, mentally, it was a painful process, but there were so many times where, 
you know, I would be alone in my bedroom and there would be pain and I would just ask God, like, you know, take it away, man, like, like help me, help me in this process. And um, there's times that he would, there are, all the time he would come in, he would do it. Now his timing would be different. Sometimes he would allow me to just like sit in this, just trust me, just trust me. And, um, you know, he would always come through. So my relationship with God is solid now, bro, solid now. Again, it ain't how much I know, you know, from the word, I know God, you know. Yeah, I know him through this experience. Um, so that was one major thing that I'm grateful for. Um, I'm also grateful for, um, I know that we all have our journey that we've gone on, and um, Pastor Freddie Russell, I was under his leadership for about seven years over at Berean, and um, he told me, he shared something with me that stuck with me, and um, he said that, you know, people, individuals in their lives have paradigm shifts. Only a very few paradigm shifts in their lives, and, and I believe for myself, my own journey, that this was one of my final paradigm shifts and how I am oriented towards God. Um, we're all products of our upbringing and of our systems that, you know, Pastor Matt talks about all the time, you know, and sometimes it, it takes those shifts to really help us to, to see God truly um, for who He is um, and to know where we stand. And so that paradigm shift was something you know, that I believe was significant for me. And my, my prayer, my desire is that, you know, as we all journey, that, you know, whatever your paradigm shift is, it may be your health, it may be in a relationship, a death of a parent or a loved one, or something, you know, may seem insignificant, but may, but may be significant to you, that that paradigm shift will orientate you more closely towards God. And um, other things, Pastor Knight, one thing that Pastor Knight have said too, also from center, to circumference, you know, that change in us happens. It happens internally. And, you know, that's something that I see so, so very much now. My relationship with my family has improved. There's been some areas that I've been digging into as it pertains to my journey um, and where the part, the part I am now, my identity, my identity in God, familiar identity, you know, and I attribute it um, to this process, you know, when you're in that corridor, I say it to my friends all the time, when, you, when you've been in this corridor, man, you're at that door, and, uh, you know, they call your name to come through, and you think to yourself, like, oh, man, there's so much left on the table. Now that God's given me this opportunity, this gift of life, you know, stuff hits different, stuff resonates different, things taste different. Those connections, those relationships are so much more sweeter and so much more in it. So I, I don't take those things for granted. So those are the things. I, I try my best to live presently in this moment. A lot of times you think about the past and the future, but I try my best to live presently in this moment and to be present. And um, so those are a couple of things that I've learned through this process and that is my desire to live out. Uh, throughout this process, I have learned that Jesus is for me. Come on, come on, let's praise God. Listen, he doesn't know this, but Duran, come on, come on up front. We want you to leave the background. We know you don't like being up front, but we want you to come up front, all the way up front. Come on, come on, come on. Let's praise God for him. Join me, join me up here on stage. Yeah, you didn't know it was going to happen. Come on. I, I, want, I want the church in the building and those online to see someone who could have died, but the Lord spared. Come on, let's give him a but if, if not but God praise, right? If it had not been, literally for the Lord on your side, you wouldn't be here, man. Listen, we love you. We want to let you know that we praise God for your deliverance, for your healing, Thank you for being generous enough and obedient enough to share your testimony because somebody else is walking through the valley of the shadow of death right now and they just got encouragement to know that it's already all right. So we want to praise God for you. We got just a gift for you just to let you know that we love you. We know that you do so much behind the scenes 
You lead an amazing media team, but we're not grateful only for what you do. Grateful for who you are and that you're still here. Church, come on. Would you, would you stretch your hands now? Stretch your hands towards Duran as we give a thanksgiving offering, a thanksgiving praise. Right now, in the name of Jesus, God, we are so grateful that we are seeing and witnessing a living, a breathing, a testimony of how good and how God you are. Thank you, Lord, for setting aside a liver just for Duran. Thank you, God, for assigning doctors and nurses just for Duran. God, thank you that you brought it just in time. Thank you for healing his body and strengthening his faith. We thank you, God. We believe you even more because we see what you've done for Duran. We thank you in Jesus' name. Let everybody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together one more time. We praise God today. Listen, this is the day of celebrations because we got baptism today too. Come on, put your hands together. I'm going to ask them to come real quick. I didn't tell them I was going to do this, but we do this every time, so you don't have to be nervous. I'm just going to ask you to come. Dylan Harris is coming. Would you just stand right here in the center real quick? Just stand facing Dylan Harris, Chloe Coopwood, and Carolyn Etheridge. Carlin Etheridge, would you come? Yes. We are so grateful that these three are joining, not only giving the Lord their lives, but also joining this community of Revision Church Atlanta. And it's, it's, it's in our tradition. We like to vote them in subject to their baptism that will immediately follow. Is there such a motion to receive them into the fellowship membership of Revision Church Atlanta? All right, I heard. Is there a second? Ready for the question? All those in favor, say amen. amen. Come on, put your hands together for your new members of Revision Church Atlanta. Those of you online, put those praise hands, those applauding hands there in the chat. We're going to ask you now, which way are we going? Then we're going to go to my right. So just turn to your right, go that way, and we're going to bring you in. Yeah, we're going to bring you in to the pool. Pastors Gina Gordon and Jordan Houston are waiting for you as they will receive you and family and friends we are celebrating with you we know that you're happy today as your loved ones uh, are being baptized we're going to ask that as each one comes into the pool we'll have dylan harris first we're going to ask in just a moment for his parents his family loved ones who are here to just stand so that as he looks out he will be able to see you. All right, here we go. I'll get out the way so we can make sure that we can see him. There we go. All right, all right. Come on, family. There you go. Good to see you. Good to see Brother McCall. All right, good to see y'all. So glad to see you. All the leaders of Revision, you know how we do. If you're a leader of Revision, just stand today. Uh, we want to let them know that we are grateful that they are joining us today. And so today... Dylan, because of your love for Jesus Christ and your faith in his power to save, it is now our privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Be faithful until he comes. Come on, church. Come on. Let him hear you. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Congratulations, Dylan. Thank you, family and loved ones. God bless you. And then today we have Chloe, Chloe Coopwood. Come on, I know the family's here. There's all kinds of supporters. We see you, we see you. Mom's got, get ready to take the picture. Dad is here, we're so grateful for you, Chloe. As you come today making this public profession of your love in Jesus Christ. And so Chloe, because of your faith in Jesus and his power to save, it is now our privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Be faithful until he comes. 
Come on, church. Amen, amen, amen. Let Chloe hear you. Congratulations, Chloe. Thank you, family and friends, as you continue to celebrate Chloe's new life in Jesus. And then we got Carolyn Etheridge as she comes today to be baptized. Family and friends, would you please stand? Yeah, we see you. We see you, family, friends, leaders. We're so grateful for you as you stand as this cloud of witnesses as we celebrate this new life in Jesus. And so, because of your faith in Jesus and his power to save, we now do baptize you in the name of the Father, name of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Be faithful until he comes. Come on, church. Come on, one more time. Let's praise God. Let him hear. All of heaven rejoices over one sinner that repents. And today we are so grateful we have three that have joined us. Today at the end of this experience, we will have another appeal. And if you want to be in the next baptism, you can make your calling and election sure, as we used to say in the church. You can make your decision today. You don't have to wait till another day, another time. Today is your day of salvation. So if you want to walk the way of these three, today at the end of the service, we'll make that appeal for you. We're excited today because before our praise team will come to lead us in our pre-sermon worship time, we have a special, we have two uh, special guests that are going to be with us today. I've seen their ministry before. They are amazing. They are powerful. I love the way that they demonstratively show the goodness of God through dance. And so we have the Psalm 3. Psalm 3. These two brothers are going to come and present to us, and then we're going to worship God as we worship in praise and worship. Let's put our hands together for Psalm 3.
the Lord. Bless the Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. We give God praise today because we serve a good God. Hallelujah. How many know we serve a good God? How many can think of at least one testimony? I can think of about a hundred. If I think, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me. Yes, Lord. Yes, God. The Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. You know the song, Lord, you are good.
Lord, I'm thankful because I love you. Lord, I love you. How many love God today? How many love God today? Lord, we love you. Our hearts cry in worship and adoration to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Think of how much you love God today. How much your heart yearns for God today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So 
praise and glorify. Simple chorus. Oh, how we praise you. Oh, how we praise. Oh, how we praise you. Oh, how we worship. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, how. Oh, how we love. Our hearts cry to you, God. Oh, how we praise. Oh, how we praise you. Oh, how we worship. Stay right there. Stay right there. Oh, Lord.
I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make a boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. For the Lord is good and greatly to be praised. Oh, taste and see. Has anyone tasted? Ah, uh, that the Lord is good. Blessed are they that put their trust in him. And so we bless the Lord today. Forget not all of his benefits. And today in this space and in this place, God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above that which we ask, think, or even expect. We're grateful last week for the preaching ministry of our assistant pastor, Pastor Gina Gordon. Come on, let's praise God for her as she preached that impactful message about fixing your posture. And whenever one of our assistants or associate pastor preaches, we are indeed blessed. We are spoiled here at Revision, and we're grateful for it. Today I want to preach, um, I need my prayer warriors to pray for me today. And maybe not so much for me uh, in terms of this message, because I know it's from God, but to pray for its efficacy, its effectiveness, its power, so that people will be able to respond to what God has to say. I want to invite you to join me on your feet as we stand in reverence for the reading of the word. I'm going to read from Mark chapter 5. Musicians, you, you can just keep playing there under me. Mark chapter 5. I'm going to go verses 1 down through 20. And then we're going to jump over to Matthew chapter 8 for just one verse. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. I'll hear, I'll preach and read from the English Standard Version. If you're ready, shout yes. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him, Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly, do not send them out of this country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. Verse 14 says, The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and people came to see what it was that had happened, and they came, hold on to this, to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man the one who had the legion sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and the pigs, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from the region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends. Huh. And like Duran, tell them how much the Lord has done for you. 
and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and everyone marveled. Now we're getting ready to pray, but you need to read, I need to read in your hearing Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. And when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him, coming out of the tombs so fierce that no one could pass that way. I want to preach today from the subject, He's Not Done Yet. Would you turn to your neighbor and tell them, neighbor, he's not done yet. Find another neighbor on the other side, either behind you or in front of you. Say, neighbor, oh neighbor, he's not done yet. Now God, have your way in Jesus' name. Amen may be seated. Here is the photo of the American artistic swimmer Anita Alvarez. On the screen you are seeing this 25 year old from upstate New York as her body sank slowly to the bottom of the pool at the world championship in Budapest. She had lost consciousness. That's what you're seeing at the end of her solo routine to the event, creating a potentially life-threatening situation as her motionless body drifted below the surface. Her coach, Andrea Fuentes, a four-time Olympic medalist from Spain, quickly scanned the pool deck and made a split decision, a split-second decision, and she jumped in with all of her clothes on to save her. Fuentes said, I jumped into the water because I saw that no one was moving and she needed help. Jakia Hollingsworth was the one who posted this on Facebook. Shout out to you. And she posed this poignant question. When you are under too long, who are the people that will look for you? Notice and dive in to pull you to the surface when you lose your strength to swim. I like that, Jakia, because she asked, who are the people that would do this for you? Because everyone needs someone like Andrea Fuentes who will notice when you've been under too long. Oh, I'm already preaching. You need somebody who will scan the deck of your life and notice you haven't come up for air for too long. You need someone, hmm, church, pray for me. You need someone who will keep calling you when you don't pick up the phone. You need someone to ask you the hard questions that you don't want to answer. You need someone who will come to get you when you don't know you are in trouble. You don't need everybody. You just need somebody. Notice, if you will, that Fuentes said she looked around and nobody was moving, so she jumped in. God, please give us a Fuentes in our lives to come get us when we are unconscious, underneath things that we can't handle by ourselves. I wish somebody would get with me because I'm already preaching. I'm not talking about Anita Alvarez and Fuentes. I'm talking about you and me. God, please put people in our lives that will come get us when we don't want to be got. That'll come look for us when we don't know we're lost. Who when we don't pick up the phone, they will come by the house or the apartment or come by our job unannounced. Is there anybody here who can pause parenthetically at the beginning of this message and just thank God for that person in your life who comes to get you, who sees about you? who cares about you greater than anything you could ever do. They just want you to be okay. And today, I solicit your prayers because I want us to dive deep. Pun intended. I want us to dive deep into another story of another person, a man who was in trouble 
And like Alvarez didn't know it, he was unconscious and he was under. But he was not underwater. He was under possession. He was unconscious because his mind had been taken over from devils and demons. It started out as two. Two became four. Four became eight. Eight, then 16, then 32. Because demons are never comfortable being alone. And if unchecked, it grows. It grows from 16 to 32, from 32 to 64, until he looks up and a legion of demons has taken over his life. It might not mean much to us when we say the word legion, but when you understand what a legion is, it is a military term to talk about how many soldiers are in a unit. And a legion could be as little as a thousand up to several thousands. This man is totally overrun by the enemy. And yet, like Fuentes, Jesus realized that this man was in trouble. And when no one else could help, Jesus comes. When no one else would help, Jesus comes. Is that the testimony of somebody who's listening to me today? That when you were in trouble and nobody could help or nobody would help, Jesus came? Jesus shows up and this man is in a horrible state. Please, please notice what state Jesus finds this man in. He has made his home in the cemetery, living amongst the dead. He is naked with open wounds, and they have been self-inflicted. The marks around his wrists and his ankles, Sheldon, revealed the failed attempts by others to restrain him. But here is Jesus. And the demons don't stand a chance. Huh. Tell me, who can stand before us when we call on that great name? Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. That's how we get the victory. Oh, but wait. This man can't even call his name. Mm, God. We don't know if the demons saw Jesus and made the man, because they were in control of his body, run towards Jesus in submission to his authority? Or if the man had a moment of clarity in the midst of his possession and ran to Jesus for the moment he could recognize him. But all we do know is Jesus sets this man free. Jesus saw he was under and not able to get out of it. So Jesus dove into his situation and pulled him out with the power that was in him. I know there's power when we call on the name of Jesus. But when Jesus cast these demons out, he does not call on any other name. He says, in my name. And under my authority, oh, I wish I had a church here today. Huh? I'm talking about the powerful name of Jesus. He says, in my name. And under my authority, you must go. And immediately the demons leap out of the man, thousands in number, into the 2,000 pigs and ran them off the cliff, doing to the pigs immediately what they would have done to the man eventually. Who God. Jesus did it. Another miracle. Another man delivered. Another one saved. But might I draw your attention to a discrepancy in the scripture? Something that I think is definitely worth noticing today. And that is that there are two somewhat conflicting stories about what happened in this region of the Gadarenes. If you're still with me, shout yes. Because I just told you in Mark chapter 5, this man overrun with demons is miraculously emancipated by the emancipator named Jesus. But Mark 
only gives one part of the story because Matthew 8 seems to contradict the story because in Matthew 8, you read it, there are two men who are possessed. Uh, that Mark says there's one, but Matthew says there's two. Now, Matthew was with Jesus when this happened. Mark, who is John Mark, a companion of Paul, is one who gets his account of the story from Peter, who was also there. Stay with me. So, Mark gets it from Peter. Matthew was an eyewitness. And Matthew says there were two. Matthew gives only basic and limited details about this story. He does not go through all of the things that Mark accounts for. And the question you got to wrestle with if you really going to wrap your head around what God is saying today is, why would Matthew emphasize that there are two men and Mark only mention one? Mark 5 says there is one man and gives details about what happens to him. He runs to Jesus. Jesus asks his name. The demons speak for the man. We are legion. The man is later found seated, clothed, and in his right mind. But then Matthew says there are two men who were there, both demon-possessed, both literally uh, trying to be tied down but were out of control. What is the discrepancy? I'm glad you asked. I want you to understand that both are telling the truth about the story. See, both men were delivered from demons, but here is the exegetical key today that will, un that will open the revelation that God wants to give us. Both were delivered from demons, but only one was found in his right mind, clothed, and ready to follow Jesus. Two men possessed. Two men delivered. But only one man stays. You're going to get it in a minute. Two men delivered. Two men set free. But one stays and one leaves. For the purposes of this message today, uh, because they are unnamed, I will refer to the one who stays as this man and the one who leaves as the other man. For you see, the other man is satisfied with being free from the possession and he leaves the scene, presumably naked and not in his right mind. Oh, God, y'all got to get this. There's two, I told you. They're both possessed. They're both hanging out in the cemetery. But Mark focuses on one. He focuses on the one who stays, but there is another one who gets the deliverance but doesn't stick around for what happens next. He leaves free of his demons, but he's not mentioned again because he's not seated, clothed, and in his right mind. See, the other man, he is no longer bound, but he ain't whole. Therefore, Mark does not deem him worthy of being mentioned. After all, what use is it to be free, but not really be free? Mark's omission is not oversight. Come here, church. It's insight. Because Mark is making a subtle comparison between two people suffering from the same thing, experiencing the same miracle, and yet having two different outcomes. The man who stays is seated, he is clothed, and in his right mind. There is distinction here. There is differentiation here. The fact that Mark mentions that he is seated clothed and his right mind means something i would suggest to you today that mark wants us to know that there is a healing that must take place after you've been rescued from something y'all finding out where i'm going mark is telling us that rescue is not enough and deliverance is not your final goal 
Mark only mentions this one because he focuses on the man in comparison to the other man so that we can know that sometimes, oh God, you can be delivered and still leave broken. Simply put, you can be free from something and still not be okay. Do I have somebody praying with me today? You can be set free from the oppression of the enemy and still not be in your right mind. There is such thing as we know, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. We know that PTSD also uh, encapsulates post-traumatic slave disorder. But there is also something as post-traumatic sin disorder. So that what you came out of, you're busy celebrating, but yet there is a miracle after the miracle that God wants to do. And I want to preach today in this Mental Health Awareness Month about that miracle because there's a lot of people who have walked in the shoes of the other man. You got your miracle, but you're still not okay. Mm, Y'all don't want to talk to me today. Spiritual deliverance is not the totality of your healing. Spiritual deliverance is not the same as mental wholeness. Spiritual awakening is not synonymous to holistic healing. Ooh, you better preach, Holy Ghost. You can be delivered from something and still deal with the psychological and mental challenges that come with the spiritual experience. And it's going to be hard for some of you to wrap your head around today, not because you lack intelligence, but because sometimes religion makes you put aside your intelligence so that you over-spiritualize things and you don't let God heal you completely. I'm already preaching. See, it can be out of you, but the effects are still in you. And this man who stayed is in his right mind. Now we must clarify something. Right mind could simply mean mental health in a general sense. But this does not imply that those with mental illnesses due to genetics, chemical imbalance, environmental causes, abuse of any kind, uh, are not in their right mind. This term right mind is not pertaining to mental illness. We are not suggesting that demon possession is the same as mental illness. Being in your right mind in this story is not dealing with mental illness of any kind. However, the principle applies that even if one is diagnosed with some kind of mental illness of some sort, we cannot be satisfied with a spiritual experience to deal with mental illness. Mm. You need to take the medication and pray. You, you, you need to do what the psychologist, the psychiatrist, the mental health professional says and believe God. I don't hear nobody praying today. Some liberal scholars have tried to suggest that these demon possessions recorded in scripture were really undiagnosed mental illness, illnesses or other medical conditions. But this is a tired attempt, church. A tired, failed attempt to discount the reality of spiritual warfare. An attempt to dismiss the truth that evil really does live in this world. And if you ain't careful, evil can live in you. There are spiritual forces that when given permission. Please hang out right there. That when given permission. They don't just jump on you because you're in an atmosphere or culture. When given permission can take over one's mind and even one's body. This is real and should not be dismissed as myth or fabrication of religion. These men were not having a break with reality. These men were not having some psychological crisis or mental health break. They were possessed by demons. But here is an important distinction. When they were possessed, they were not in control of their minds. 
But when they got delivered from their possession, they were still not in their right minds. Oh, wait just a minute, preacher. What do you mean? With possession, they were not in control of their minds. But after the miraculous deliverance from Jesus, they are free from the demon possession, but they still are not in their right minds. They needed help because of what they suffered. They needed help beyond the rescue from oppression. Because being in one's right mind is referring to the restoration of mental health uh, capability after dealing with tra traumatic experiences. Just because you came out of something does not mean it's through with you. And part of the problem I came to address today is that we convinced ourselves that spiritual change is enough. And so like the other man, once we come to Jesus, once we got our miracle, once we got our deliverance, we did not even think about the fact that what we came out of had a psychological impact on us but we settled, watch this, for salvation and pushed aside restoration. That's why some of you are so quiet today. Because we downplay and ignore the need for mental health. As if it's in competition with our spirituality. Or maybe we told ourselves, watch this, I'm going to get in trouble right here. We told ourselves that spiritual change automatically leads to good mental health. But somebody ought to talk to me today. You know that ain't true. You can have a spiritual change and still have mental health challenges. If you haven't processed your experience properly and thoroughly. What these men went through being possessed was traumatic and damaging to their psyche. They needed more than just getting the devil out of them. Mm, God, help me today. I I'm trying to help you as your pastor today that you need more than just a euphoric spiritual experience. You need more than just an uplifting worship environment that makes you forget about your stuff. Oh God, somebody help me. You need more than just being in the church and running around and throwing up praise hands. You need more than just having an ecstatic experience where you feel the Holy Ghost. You need more than that because you can have all of that and still fall to pieces. Now, I'm just challenging some of your spiritual and theological sensitivity because you were told in Sabbath school and Sunday school that as long as you get your breakthrough, as long as you get delivered, as long as you come to salvation, everything will be all right. Well, it's partly true. The part they didn't tell you is, is after you get deliverance from it, you need help to get over it. There were two. How many? There were two. How many? Two demon possessed. Two got delivered. Only one stayed clothed and in his right mind. The other man leaves naked and he doesn't have his right mind. Ooh, God help me to hang out, hang out right here. He's delivered, but he's not in his right mind. <laughs> he ain't got the devil in him. But he's not whole. Ooh, I'm coming. I'm coming. Save me a seat. I'm going to sit right down beside you. He, 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 he go to church on the right day. But still ain't in his right mind. And you can tell it from his relationships. You can tell it from his toxicity. You can tell it 
from his lack of ability to deal with stress and feelings of overwhelm. Can I talk to the maybe 50 real people who showed up in church today who can testify you can have Jesus and still have some mental challenges. And we've all met that other man. The other man is the person who knows the Bible but doesn't know how to treat people. The other man is the person who is always listening to gospel music but their energy is always stressful and negative. Oh, can I preach it like I feel it? The other man is the person who always going to church but they are jealous hearted and always hating on somebody else. The other man is the person who knows Bible prophecy, but they stay anxious with panic attacks and feelings of overwhelm. I'm all in your business today because God got all up in mine. We've all met the other man because sometimes the other man is the person we see in the mirror. We are free, but not free. We know a lot, but we don't know how to be. The other man is seated. This man, this man is seated, clothed, and in his right mind. Both got rescued. Both came to Jesus. Only one was made whole. Can I tell you uh, what's really going on here? Is that you must understand it's great To start a relationship with Jesus, it is the best decision you could ever make in your life to let him deliver you from what you are in. But I want to let you know he's not done yet. Oh, God, help me get this today. He set you free from sin. He set you free from addiction. He set you free from that toxic and abusive marriage. But he's not done yet. Jesus came to set them free so that they could be fully human. And to be fully human, they needed to have not only a spiritual experience, but psychological and emotional wholeness. Human beings need to be in their right minds, not just in the right church. (laughs) All right, Edward, they're going to make me work hard today. Because some of y'all thought you were doing good because you in the right church. You in the right denomination. You come on the right day. But what my Bible tells me is, is that I got to have the right mind. Let this mind that was also in Jesus be in you. And there's a whole lot of folk who got the right day, the right church, the right denomination, the right traditions, and got the wrong mind. If Jesus, can I push it a little bit further? If Jesus had only set them free, but not been willing to give them back their minds, he would have ignored part of their humanity. Because Jesus saves you from your sin, but after he saves you from your sin, he's not done with you yet. There's so much more he wants for you. He wants you to have peace. He wants you to have joy. He wants you to be content. He wants you to live in hope. He wants you to walk in favor. There is so much more to your story. He did not come just to get the devil out of you. He came to give you life and life more abundantly. And what happened to this other man is this. Those of you who take notes, write this down. What happened to the other man is this. He was satisfied with the first miracle. But he didn't hang around for the second one. I call it the second miracle. See, the first miracle is what he saved you from. But the second miracle, Kiran, is saving you from the effects of what you've been through. Oh, God. Oh, this might not hit unless you've been to therapy. 
Uh, this might not hit until you push through the pain to get some more help. Maybe you're struggling to get this today because you don't know you're in need of the second miracle. See, he's not done with you because he wants you to think about yourself in healthy ways. He's not done with you and you know he ain't done with you when every time you mess up, you are harder on yourself than he is. Mm, I just said something. He's not done with you because he wants you to think about people in a healthy way. Jesus ain't done with you because he needs you to walk in the best of mental health so that you can be the best witness that you can be. Jesus came to save us from our sin and, somebody shout and, to restore us, to restore to us everything sin tried to take from you. The problem with this other man is he didn't stick around. We've settled for salvation. We've not stuck around for restoration. If you stick around, you'll see the second miracle. So that you can be stressed without losing your temper. If you stick around, you'll see the second miracle. You can overcome anxiety and panic attacks. If you stick around, thank you Jesus, he'll do the second miracle. You can come out of self-defeating thoughts and negative thinking, but you've got to stick around to see what God is about to do next. And I have a sneaky suspicion that God, even today, is about to do the second miracle for somebody. That God is about to turn some things around. But in order to do it, you've got to do what the man who stayed did. I'm almost through, but watch this. There's a few things he did. First thing is, the man who stayed was aware of his true condition after he was delivered. Oh, God. Ah, Somebody shout after. He was aware of his true condition after he was delivered. Who religious people going to struggle right here? After. After. After the baptism. After coming down to the appeal. After the Bible studies. After taking communion. The man who stayed was aware of his true condition after. See, the man who stayed realized that he was still not whole even after he was delivered. Don't miss this. He had an awareness that made him stay with the one who delivered him. He was aware that there was more work to do because when he was delivered, he realized he was naked in a cemetery. I'm in your text. <laughs> he, when he came to himself, he realized after the deliverance that he's still living naked in a place of dead people and you are not whole oh holy ghost help me if you are delivered by jesus and you are still naked in a place of death his awareness was that he was naked his true state was he didn't have no clothes on and you have to be aware of your mental condition after somebody shout after after you come out of a spiritual fight because there is something still needed after. And most of God's people don't let God do the work after their breakthrough. I need you to hear this today. There is an after effect that happens in your psyche when God brings you out of something. I know God delivered you, but what toll did it take on you? I know God is able and he's never lost a case, but what did the battle do to you? <sighs> Y'all get to get real with me. I know, I know if God before you, because we like to quote, right? If God before you, who can be against you? But what did the struggle do to you while he was fighting your battles? Because every spiritual battle takes a toll on your mind. And I believe, yes, yes, Holy Ghost, I believe it is a work of the enemy that has caused the church 
to be satisfied with spiritual and religious experiences and never deal with their mental health because as long as he's got the brokenness of your mind the devil don't care how much prophecy you know the reason he's wreaking havoc in your home oh god huh, is because he's got the brokenness of your mind he's activating while you come to church on sabbath and if you're not careful you will be fooled into thinking that just because it turned out okay that you are okay you might be delivered but you're still not okay you still don't trust people I'm talking real talk today you still can't forgive your family members you still can't love and be loved by others that's why every time you get in a relationship you act funny you act strange and you push them away you push love away you are not okay you still can't be happy oh i'm gonna keep calling until i get into your row you still ain't content Every time something good happens for you, you start bracing yourself for the next thing that's going to go wrong. You are not okay. You are not okay, and I know you think you're okay because you prayed this morning, but before, in between your prayer in the morning and your prayer at night, you have panic attacks and anxiety. You are not okay with your saved, sanctified self, quoting scripture, singing gospel music. Do I have anybody here who's going to be real to understand you can have all that and you are not okay? And half the battle is won when Christians humble themselves, stop being so super spiritual, and confess, I am not okay. The Bible says the men were naked. The men, both of them, one left naked because he didn't know. He didn't realize the toll of the possession on him. But the man who stayed, huh, the man who stayed got something different. For you see, when you are naked, you are exposed. So that what should be kept private is exposed to everyone. And some of us are psychologically naked, exposing to people things they should not know or see. Your pain is exposed, and it shows up in your conversation. Your trauma is exposed, and it shows up in your relationship. Ooh, you better preach, Holy Ghost. Your emotional life is exposed, and that's why your mood changes even though the situation didn't. And that's why you go off on people. And that's why your anxiety takes over. And that's why you're paranoid about every new relationship. And that might be the reason why you're on your fourth marriage. Your pain is exposed. And the pain of what you experienced has got you up in here psychologically naked. And when you're exposed, you're vulnerable. When you expose, you're vulnerable, and that's how you end up in another toxic relationship. When you're exposed and vulnerable, that's how you end up staying in abuse when you should have left a long time ago. When you are exposed and vulnerable, that's how you end up in cycles. When you're exposed and you're vulnerable, that's how you become susceptible to manipulation. But this man who stayed... If you're going to be whole, this man who stayed realized the second miracle has to be done. That God has something more for me. And unlike the other man, this man stays because he knows he can't go back to his family naked. He can't go back exposed. My prayer for you today is that you will not be satisfied with this spiritual experience, but you'll make up your mind, I want Jesus to get me some clothes. I pray to God for you today that you stop acting like you okay and let God make you okay. 
All right, some of y'all look like you look like you're bored. Let me let me push on. Here's the second thing he did. The second thing he did is that the man who stayed asked for additional help. I'm in your Bible. The Bible records that because this man stayed, he is clothed. This means he either had to ask the disciples in Jesus for help or he had to remain willing to receive the help that was offered. Ooh, God. God deliver us from our unwillingness to ask for or receive the help we need. The other man left without the help he needed. But this man asked for help. The problem that is that most people, including Christians, are not willing to ask for help. Because you see it as weakness. A sign of lack of faith in God. I sat in a Sabbath school class in a church that I will not name in this city and the teacher had the audacity to say that if you go to counseling or ask for help, you do not have faith in God. The devil is a liar. Because we see it as an admission of a lack of spiritual strength. But everyone needs help after you are delivered. All right, all right, y'all, y'all make me work hard. Let me give you this illustration. Get out your way. Uh, I'm in your Bible, Lazarus. Y'all remember Lazarus? Lazarus is a man who dies, friend of Jesus. Jesus comes to him after he's been dead. Four days, he's now rotting and stinking in the grave. Lazarus is miraculously resurrected as Jesus prays to his father and asks for the power to bring the dead back to life. Don't miss this. Lazarus is resurrected from the dead. A miraculous healing from Jesus and yet when he comes out of the grave, he needs help being unwrapped after his miracle. What? You you, you didn't catch that? He had new life and he still needed help. He was upright. He still needed help. He was moving forward But Kenny, he still needed help. And I'm talking to somebody today in this building or watching me online where you got delivered, but you still need help. You know what's interesting about Lazarus' story is that Jesus does not help Lazarus out of what he's wrapped up in. He only resurrects him. I'm right in your Bible. I'm right there. John 11, it, it, he, he raises him, right? So it's divine deliverance. But then when he raises him from the dead, he's mummified. He's wrapped up. He's moving forward, but he needs some help. And Jesus says, I've done divine intervention. He now turns to the people, the human beings, and he says, now you loose him and let him go. Okay, now, 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 now you're with me. Now you're with me. See, Jesus does the first miracle but then he tells human beings I need you to cooperate with me to do the second miracle Lazarus needed additional help it was divine deliverance in cooperation with human help therapists are human help mental health counselors are human help marriage therapists and certified marriage coaches are human help And wait a minute, sometimes pastors are not the people to offer you the additional help you need. Because even though I'm a pastor, I have limitation on my skill to be able to wade into the deep waters of your toxicity and abuse. Oh, God. And some of y'all are stuck because you just want somebody to pray for you. And what you need is somebody to pray for you while somebody talks to you. So that the prayers on your behalf, along with your awareness, you can take back to God and say, now I know where you need to fix me. Now I know where you need to heal me. Now I know what's broken inside me. Do I have any help in the building? Divine deliverance with human help. 
Jesus did not unwrap Lazarus. The people had to do it. And the reason why some of you still wrapped is you waiting on God to come down and do what he told you to seek human help for. Ooh, just said something. This man who stayed, huh, huh, he ends up clothed. Jesus looks around at the disciples who ain't done nothing in the story yet. Jesus done healed these two men. One left, one stayed. They sitting up there just being voyeurs on a miracle. Ooh, that's a whole other sermon. They standing there watching what God can do. Jesus said, get this man some help. Give him some clothes. You need divine intervention with human help. Finally, Jesus, huh, you got to understand what's happening here. Jesus had come all this way to get this man. One prophetic writer says that the storm that precedes this story in Mark chapter 4, the storm that Jesus came through as he sailed across the Sea of Gadarenes to get to this region, that the storm was of a huh, spiritual, not natural nature. That the enemy huh, was actually trying to stop Jesus from getting to the other side because the enemy knew he had control of two men on the other side and knew the potential of their witness if they were delivered. Oh God, y'all ain't helping me finish this sermon. Jesus came all the way over the sea just to save these men. You know how I know? Because once he delivered them, the one that left, and then there's one who stayed, once he was through with him, they got back in the boat and went back. See, he didn't come all this way to play games with you. Jesus did not come all this way just to have you sit up in church. He left his throne and came through Mary's tomb. He left the adulation of angels to deal with jealous Pharisees. He left the security of heaven to walk the dangerous streets of Nazareth. He endured speculation and suspicion. He was befriended and then betrayed. He was arrested, I'm talking about Jesus, and assaulted. He was tried and then he died. He got up from the grave alive and you think he did all that so you can come up in church and be just as sick as you were when you came? The devil is a liar. Jesus did not go through all of that so you could limp through life. Jesus went through all of that so that you might have life and life more abundantly. So here's the last thing you got to understand, Reed. He's sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. He's sitting there because there's a difference between experiencing something and being grateful for something. You can experience a breakthrough or a miracle from God and not really understand what he did for you. You can be a recipient of his favor and still not understand the depths of what he saved you from. Because if the other man who left understood what Jesus had done for him, he would not have left naked and not in his right mind. Because people who don't understand what Jesus has done for you have to be prodded and begged and guilt tripped into saying thank you. They're the ones who in no form or fashion really give God praise because they don't really understand what they were delivered from. But as I take my seat, if there anybody in the building or watching me online, well, you may not know a whole lot about theology. You don't understand uh, the machinations of psychology. You don't understand the minute de details of soteriology. You might not understand the minutia of prophecy, but there's one thing you know. You were once dead, and now you were alive. You were once down, and then he brought you up. If you know it, then you ought to say thank you. Thank you, I didn't 
didn't lose my mind. Thank you. Thank you. I still got enough sense left to know where my blessings come from. Come on, help me close. Thank you. Thank you for restoring what the enemy tried to take. Thank you that even in the midst of everything, I still got joy. Thank you that even when all is falling around me, I still have peace. Thank you. I got more good days than I have bad days. I won't complain. Somebody in the building ought to wave your hands and shout thank you. Thank you for bringing me a mighty long way. Thank you that even though I was broken, I ain't broken no more. Thank you that the negative prophecies they spoke over me, you canceled them. Thank you. Thank you that I survived a toxic home environment where my parents put food on the table, but they didn't know how to love me. Thank you. Thank you that the sins of my father did not visit me. Come on, say thank you. Thank you that you made a way. Thank you, you open doors. Thank you, you're healing me. Thank you, you're fixing me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You haven't given up on me yet. Thank you, you woke me up this morning. Thank you, you started me on my way. Thank you, I'm in my right mind. Thank you, say yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Because he ain't done yet. You got your first miracle. Some of you got your first miracle. He's waiting on you to make yourself available for the second one. Because the second miracle is how you go from simply attending church to walking in the authority of Jesus. The second miracle is when you move past church attendance and membership into wholeness of mind, body, and spirit. And I came to let you know today, he ain't going to give up until he's done with you. Hallelujah. Here's, here's the appeal. The Bible said this man who was healed, mind, body, and spirit, did something that the other man didn't do. Jesus is about to leave. And he says, please, let me be with you. Because you see, when you're healed holistically, mind, body, and spirit, nobody can make you walk away from the one who delivered you. And today there's some people who need to say, like this man, I want to be with you. Jesus said, you can't come with me, but here's what I need you to do. Go back to your city, go back to your town, and tell them all the wonderful things I've done for you. Because you can't witness unless you let them do the second miracle. Your witness is stunted. It's hindered in its fullness until you let him do the second one. He got you out of it. Now let him heal you from it. If you're here today and like the two men, you want to make a decision like this man. The one who stayed. I'm not going to take long. I'm not going to beg you. We're out of time. I need you to meet me at the altar saying, I want you to do the second miracle. Yeah, I don't do what I used to do anymore. See, we, we get real satisfied with that. I don't do the things I used to. Yeah, but you think the same way. It's not enough to stop doing what you used to do. You got to get all the way free. And all the way free is when you don't see yourself as your sin. 
you see yourself as your as the savior sees you we ain't playing games here today because he's not done with you yet and I challenge I challenge the mindset that tells you you are okay because you're part of a certain church or, de- or denomination. I come against the lie that the enemy told you that all you've got to do is pray it away. I come against that in the name of Jesus. You need prayer and you need help. I told you church Jesus in the garden he's talking to his father this is Jesus and he tells the disciples I need you to watch over me because while I'm talking to God I need a human being beside me to help me and that's why I'm glad we're going to announce in just a minute Pastor Gene is going to tell you about it but we, we, we partnered with a mental health um, a mental health platform where we're going to pay for some people to get the church on us we are going to pay for you to get therapy sessions because we need revision to be whole he's more than able your heads are bowed I'm getting ready to pray but there's somebody else who needs to make a decision listen we talked about the second miracle today but there's some people here who need the first one you you, you need God to bring you out of some stuff you, you can't even deal with the psychological and emotional uh, trauma from it because you're still in it and you need Jesus to call out of you what's controlling you in the name of Jesus, I'm asking you to come forward. Come on, step forward. I see you, brother. Come on, there's somebody else. Come on, there's somebody else who's not already at the altar that needs to be here. You're saying, listen, there's some stuff in me. I need God to do the first miracle. I need him to get what's in me out of me. I got to overcome some habits. I got to overcome some thought patterns. I got to overcome some stuff that so easily uh, uh, besets me. Come on, come on, come on. Ha ha. God is moving. God is moving. Come on, church. You're praying now. Online, you're praying. That's right, sister. I see you coming. Come on, come on. You're saying, I'm believing. You are doing just what the two men did. They came to him. Listen, they couldn't even talk. They couldn't say a word. Jesus read the hearts of these men who could not speak and gave them a deliverance on credit. So while you're lying to yourself and telling yourself you got to fix yourself, Jesus is saying, if I could heal two demoniacs full of demons who never asked or said anything and I still deliver them, I can. I will deliver you. God, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for Jesus who came while we were unconscious. In fact, your word says came while we were yet sinners before we were born and gave us life so that we might have eternal life thank you for coming for us when we didn't even know we needed help and God we pray today that you will do you will perform the first miracle for some people here get that stuff that thing that thought that action that habit that addiction out in the name of Jesus we call on the same name that the demons tremble at and we ask God that what you did for them you will do for us get it out we don't want to be like that we don't want to live like that anymore get it out and then God once you do the first miracle we give you permission that's why we're at the altar to do the second one get us whole heal our minds help us to humble ourselves oh God to to let you do divine intervention while we seek human help 
so that together we can become whole mind, body, and spirit. We thank you for what you are about to do. We praise you in advance for how you're about to move. And we anticipate the new people we will be in Christ Jesus. We thank you in Jesus' name. Let everybody say amen and hallelujah. Put your hands together. Listen, before you go back to your seat. There are some who made a decision today. You're saying, I need God to do that first miracle. There's some things I prayed as you were praying, Pastor. You're saying as you were praying, there's some things I was releasing to God. For some of you, you need to, you need to give your lives to Jesus. It's not just him coming in and rescuing you. Don't be like the other man. This man who stayed, followed. He said, I, I want to be with you. And so if you want to be with Jesus in a relationship, not just an experience, but a relationship. If that's you, I want you, Pastor Jordan, just raise your hand to my right, your left. I want you to sit right here in the front row beside Pastor Houston. We're just going to pray with you briefly after church. We're going to get your name and number. We also have, I think, on the screen for those who are watching online, we have the QR code that we'll put up. You can just open your phone app, point it towards the screen. It will generate a small form. Just need your name, number, and you check one of the boxes. If you want to join Revision Church Atlanta, give your life to Jesus be baptized you can do that today we're going to leave that up so that you make that decision today even in this building if you haven't come to the altar we'll leave it up so that you can be able to join give your life to Jesus or get access to intercession for us to pray with you as you go back to your seats those who are making the decision join revision give my life to Jesus I just need somebody to partner with me in prayer that God brings me out of whatever I'm in. I want you to sit right beside Pastor Houston as we receive you today. Come on, church, as the Lord has spoken to you. Come on, put your hands together. Pastor Gene is going to tell you about what we're going to do to support you support members in their mental health and in their wholeness. She's also going to lead us in our final part, which is giving in worship. We thank God for you. We praise the Lord for you. We're looking forward to what God is going to continue to do on your behalf. Amen. Amen. Church, I am so excited to announce that here at Revision, we are able to cover eight sessions, eight counseling sessions for 10 people. Uh, eight counseling sessions for 10 people. So if you would like to be one of the 10 people we would like to, we are covering the cost for, there's a QR code on the screen now where you can just shine your phone to and sign up to be one of those 10 people. One of the reasons many of us are not able to get that second miracle is because of finances. And here today at Revision, we want to step in the gap and pay the price for you to have eight free counseling sessions with better help. You can access this. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You can access this uh, if even if you're watching virtually, if you're wherever you are around the world, you can access this and be a part of this. Sign up, and we will be choosing the 10 people who will receive these free counseling sessions next month. We also have another initiative coming on tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, we are partnering with Atlanta Harvest, a black-owned farm, to help them. Amen? Can we get... We are partnering with them to help increase fresh organic food to our community. So there is still space to sign up. Sign up and join us tomorrow morning. We have two shifts from 10 to 12 and then from 1 to 3. We're also, there's more, we're also partnering with uh, Atlanta Southside Medical. We are doing a 5K run or walk. If you want to walk, that's okay. We are partnering with them to do a 5K, and all proceeds to this uh, run will go towards the Southside Medical Community Center. And 
one more. One more, we can't forget, we are rolling out a new worship schedule and every fourth Sabbath, can you say, what, what Sabbath? Every fourth Sabbath, every fourth Saturday, we will be having Selah and it will be a time for you to commune with those around you, coworkers in your homes and to worship God at home home. So if you would like to be a host of this experience, if you would like to offer up your home or even just join a, to form a group to join anywhere, Lord, we just pray that you will join and there will be another QR code. But also if the QR code does not come up, there will be a table in the back right after service where you can say, hey, I want to be a host and I want to offer up my home to be a Selah host. Not to forget, all of these initiatives are funded through our ties and offering. Offering, They are not possible without your generosity. So if you would love to give to what the Lord is doing here, you can give through Cash App, through PayPal, and through our website. Amen, amen. I got through all that. Now, I ask you to stand as we do our closing prayer that the Lord will do something here, but also something as you leave here. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your word today, for the songs today, for all that happened here today that transformed us spiritually. But there's also more work to be done, God. And I pray over every person here, every family here, that the work will continue. For if you start it, Lord, we know you'll finish it. So we'll cover everyone, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, cover them. We ask in the name of Jesus, we all say, amen, amen. You are dismissed. This praise belongs to you, oh my Lord, oh my Lord, cause today is the day you've made, I'll rejoice and again I'll say it's true, oh my Lord, oh my Lord, the enemy came to steal, but you gave me life. I won't let him take what he did not get. I'm getting my soul back. I'm taking my joy back. I found my peace in the presence of God. I found my strength in the presence of God. I say, oh, I need.